Welcome. This is the March 26th Jail and Zones production user call. We have Rod, Jan, Chris, and myself, Michael. And I'd like to start off with a topic that I brought up at the previous eDeveloper Summit in Taipei. So I did a little presentation and I can show you the slides, which are quite simple. And I called it Uptime Funk, which is based on a rather silly SUSE Linux um, promo video they did a few years back. <clears throat> My observation was you have one job and I compared a few uptimes and they're all kind of very similar and equally perhaps terrible, depending on your opinion. You can look at my slides link there, but I want to point out some super specific things. One, there's arbitrary relative, um, not arbitrary, but relative output like seconds, minutes, days, and then perhaps hours and seconds again. Uh, I guess it's related to the W command of who. So you get all the stuff about users and load average, which I don't really care for, but I personally would like an uptime dash s for seconds. Apparently UCL might be hiding in there, but it's not in the manual page whatsoever. Something like date formatting might be nice and GNU uh, related, GNU date has <clears throat> nanosecond support, which I remember doing some benchmarks, Chris, and it was like, all of my results are one second. It's like, ah, uh, yeah, not helpful. <laughs> um, now the hard part, and Antrenik brought this up. In a jail, to bring it on topic, a jail gives you the host's uptime, and there are times you would want that, and there are times you don't want that. And if it depends on like a UTX file or something, your jail might not have the some of the evidence you want. People point out that, yes, fortunately, there is like uh, there are time related uh, sys controls. So I think it's like boot time or something, which is handy, but I don't think there's one per jail and uh, we don't have it within reach. So uh, I've relayed those bullet points here and i would just love to briefly hear your thoughts and observations uh particularly obviously with regard to jails because having a build jail that normally takes 10 minutes to do its build have an uptime time of three months is like not like accurate shall we say yeah and te technically that's leaking host information and technically a jail shouldn't have host information visible to it unless it's explicitly been granted beautifully put number of cpus repeat that another leak according to that definition uh, just comes oh. trolling sorry that's a whole topic no no it's a that's a actually very valid topic that you you know this 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 hopefully opens up a few discussions because it's like this utility has one job and it's terrible at it. And it's terrible at it on every OS I, I could find. Um, FreeBSD's uptime has libxo support and it, you can get a time of day, uptime, days, hours, minutes, seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, uptime human format, uh, users and load averages uh, as floating point out of it. Do you see that in the manual page or the W manual page? Um, I, I found out by uh, cheating, I executed a uh... Yeah, I don't, from my look at my manual page here, I don't think the manual page has been touched since 3.0 BSD. <laughs> see the problem? <laughs> exactly. Um... Like... The heck? And people in the audience are like, oh, yeah, it has this, this, and this. I'm like, I'm not seeing it. And how shall your average user sitting down to look at uptime know that? I mean, do they have to, oh, well, check the sources, like for UCL support and what the heck's UCL support? So I was kind of surprised by all this. Someone uh, must have come in, put in uh, libx. Somebody that doesn't know how to write UCL? manual pages made the changes to the code and committed them and just ignored the manual page. It's very common. Yeah, a common problem. Is there any tooling support? Uh, so if you have something like if you're touching a function calling get opt or something, then it uh, reminds you to please look if the main page is still up to date or something. Hmm. Uh, or the main dot something or the command name dot something. If you're touching that, please uh, just basically as a push or commit hook or whatever. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Anything to help release engineering 
uh, catch it or even better, someone with it's not uh, really before that. James. That's well, that would only work if you actually have some relation because some of the man pages don't necessarily have the same name like the tool. Yeah, you're right. It wouldn't be easier. You're right. And so I guess uptime is technically the W command and has a weird relationship to it, which might not be obvious to people. Also, welcome, Daniel. So, yeah, uh, I, yeah, let's... Uh, those are all very good points on a very, very simple, tangible subject. Oh, Doug, hello. Awesome. Gangs landing. So uh, my hope alone was to plant a seed about uptime. And for those who are rolling in as we speak, I did a quick presentation at the FreeBSD Developer Summit in Taipei about uptime and the notion that it has one job and it's not very good at that job. So the, the slides are linked right there. I can put them in the chat too. Oh, and there is chat. Okay, so uh, welcome Daniel and Doug. Doug, do you have any topics as a developer? I hope to give you priority. Um, so very small news uh, we had a meeting of the oci freebsd oci runtime working group last week and um the main thing i i, I want to bring from that and i mentioned that in mentioned it in this meeting as well is we're looking for um user stories things that they would like a container runtime to do i mean i've seeded the thing with my own ideas uh, but I'm absolutely certain that's incomplete. And if we want to make uh, a, an OCI runtime extension for FreeBSD that people that meets people's needs, I think we'll have done a good job. So um, I think Greg Wallace was going to um, call for a bit of participation in this on, on social media and, and so on. And... Um, the way of participating is to raise a pull request against the requirements.md file in the working group repository, which we've linked in previous meetings. Excellent. That's about it. Uh, with your experience in containers, uh, the key point relating to jails on uptime was that a Jail shows the host uptime, which uh, has been pointed out is by Rod is a considered a security vulnerability. There might be circumstances mm -hmm. where you want that, but generally you don't want the the jail to have what's often a completely implausible uptime. Do you have any observations from, say, Linux container land? Have they shimmed in something? Because from my sweep, it seems uptime is pretty terrible on every OS out there. Let me try. I've got a Linux VM running here somewhere. Let me see if I can answer that question. Thank you. Chat. Yeah, the running up time inside a container gives the host value on using you for Podman on Fedora. But it's going to be the same everywhere. Yeah, okay. Um, am I alone in thinking that that might need some love? <laughs> I would think so, um, because I don't see yeah. a big issue with seeing the host uptime. Uh, it would be nice if yeah, you I can think... fake it, but it's yeah. not a security vulnerability in my or even problem, uh, in my opinion, I, unless it, you it, have a really contrived time. example. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not convinced it's a big risk, but I suppose we could group it with the um, UTS values, which you can have private in the container um, on both OSs. This has been it's... part of jails for uh, forever. Um, so it goes with host name and, and domain name, perhaps. 
It's not a security concern. It's an information leak. Sure, sure. Well, and my example from uh, the Dev Summit was... Uh, leak. A link. Yes, thank you. Uh, leak. Uh, so if you are routinely doing a build like uh, what Rob was doing of his ZFS tools, and you know your build takes three minutes, and it's in a jail that's disposable, and you check the uptime, and if you're a minute into three minutes, you know you're about a third through the build, um, just having simple, accurate metadata for such things could be useful. Anywho, welcome, Antronik. Well, cool. Uh, um, a less contrived uh, corner case would be uh, the load uh, numbers visible via, for example, via the uptime command inside a jail. If I remember correctly, you see the system host uh, oh, that's load a numbers, point. not the jail's own load which it so, makes sense because the scheduler normally doesn't really care uh, and tries to aim for fairness, not for uh, any kind of hierarchical scheduling. So, Antrenig, you're actually to blame for this conversation. You pointed out that uptime is limited and actually on FreeBSD, the tool itself is much more capable than the manual page will suggest. So, uh, there have been some pretty good points so far, and if you've got some more to add, let her rip. Yeah, I I agree with Rod that you know having a jail showing a host of time is a security leak, and um, hmm. that information also, possibly security. Yeah, and th that has been also one of the issues in our honeypot deployments. Like we don't know people to know that the possible load is very high because there are you know possibly dozens to hundreds of honeypots on a single machine. So, which 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 would be weird if if your container is you know uh, not running, let's say MongoDB for example. So you know it it it, it that that also a very concerning thing for us. Um, which and there are also a lot of other tools that my team has tested, base tools to be more specific, that report information of the host to the jail. Some are okay, some are not. Obviously. What examples so, do you have? Uh, I do have to go over our documentation, but yeah, the uptime and the, um, uh, what was its name? The other one, um, uh, there were multiple, you know, boot related stuff that, that we found. And there's also some other stuff that I have to look into, but yeah, there are some good amount. Do you and have a way to be a little louder? I can, I personally can oh, not hear you super well. One, two, three, four. Better slightly. Yeah. Okay. I think it's just my microphone. That is, there we go very far away from me. Yeah. Send caffeine um, or something. So let me try to think. Um, yeah, and the one of the interesting ones that we discovered today, uh, I, I don't know if this is, you know, uh, on topic of today or not, is that if you have IPFW enabled on the host, which many people do, and you run a jail, the IPFW inside the jail will always be um, block by default, block everything by default. Like even if you don't have firewall enable equals yes in the jail, as long as the kernel module is enabled, it is available in the jail, which is a nice feature, of course, but by default, it's gonna be, you know, by default, it's gonna be block all. And you're like, why is the HCP not working? Why is this not working? Why is that not working? Like, oh, it's just the firewall is enabled. Um, no, no, no. Even with firewall in, it. yeah, even with oh, firewall, it was no, yeah. no, no. Uh, the, the that sentence was correct. My apologies. And Jan pointed out that there is, you know, uh, firewall uh, default to accept equals one. Yeah. Um, I don't know if many people know about that one. I mean, we do, yeah. but uh, um, for for new coming users, it it might be weird that it's 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 blocked by default, which so is the correct. The nice thing, sorry. The nice thing is that this is uh, not just a loader tunable, but you can. It's a kernel environment where you can change uh, at runtime, so you can set this variable before you load the uh, IPFW module, so that you don't lock yourself out before you have the configuration loaded. Which is nice if you want to, for example, do a remote installation. Um, but yeah, I don't think the uh, default settings of IPFW are completely jail aware, unless yeah. basically the kernel environment variables are not, but the CCDLs are partly or something. I would have to check if you, but yeah. 
And um, today we had a RIPE training in Armenia, uh, as in RIPE NCC. Uh, and um, uh, we, uh, I've configured a IPv6 only jail, which uh, was not hard to do. That was the easy part, of course. Um, and then I was also able to configure DNS 6.4, which converts IPv4 DNSs IPv4 only DNSs to IPv6. A good example of that is Twitter and GitHub, which still don't have IPv6. Um, and then I used IPFW as NAT64, which converts the IPv6 to a IPv4 when it goes out. It's also very common in European ISPs to do that uh, due to the lack of IPv4, of course. Um, Armenia, we do it the other way around. If you have IPv6, we just disable it for you. So, <laughs> and yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, NAT64, which is supported by IPFW, uh, works fine uh, completely. I I think that there might be either a bug or a feature. I'm not sure. Which is if you use an IP, uh, if you use an IPv4 address or NAT64, right? So that's going to be your gateway address. Uh, you cannot use that IPv4 address for anything else. Like you cannot use it to connect to the host, even if that IP is set on the host, right? Um, uh, now in, in NAT44, or as we call it, you know, just NAT, um, that works fine, right? You can use the same IP address for uh, uh, NATing your jails, for example and to set it on the host. But I was not able to um, configure it on IPFW, although I might have configured it wrong because, you know, short time for training. Um, the PF does support NAT64. However, it's not merged into FreeBSD yet. Uh, yeah, I, that, that... I tried it. I couldn't get I couldn't get it working. It was driving me crazy. Uh, yeah, um, it's you, not merged. Are you aware of the one pass, IPFW one pass flag? Well, IPFW, I know it's I know it's doable. It's PF that I couldn't get. I tried to some of the proxies and stuff. I could never get it on that sixty four working. Yeah, uh, the problem uh, is yeah, sorry. The problem is that while FreeBSD may have potentially truly invented the divert socket, only OpenBSD has extended divert sockets to support IPv six. So uh, anything which uses divert sockets uh, for IPv6 uh, packet processing just can't be done on FreeBSD because we have divert sockets, but we don't have IPv6 capable divert sockets. And the other part is that uh, you would have to do all the FreeBSD multi-threading changes to PF to port their uh, NAT64 logic over. And that was so far beyond the syntax split uh, fork that um, yeah, there's like more development since that split since before than before. So, um, yeah, by now it's not that easy to port anything over. Right, though, I could, couldn't, I, a lot. couldn't I hack it with a, with a, yeah, I mean, there are, there are proxies that they're, they're not 64 yes. proxies that I could use I with PF. You can do it I, I, with something. I forgot the name. I got there it. is a port available for it and it does it on a top interface and that works. I got But it's slow because it goes through a tab. So if you it's only want to use it, um, so you uh, can. Daniel, but... I, I, I was really persistent on making PF work because I, 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 we use PF basically everywhere. And uh, one of the easiest way of doing it on FreeBSD, if because our PF doesn't support um, NAT64 NAT yet, is you use PF as you would use PF, and then you have a user land application that does the proxying. One of them is called Taiga. It is in ports. Right. Taiga. That's I. Yeah. I, that's what I tried. I, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get oh, it going. But maybe, maybe I wasn't. Per I might not have been persistent enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was in the training and I really wanted to prove like, no, this should work, you know. And the reason why I wanted, because like all of the ISPs, they were doing, um, you know, Cisco stuff because, uh, you know, they're ISPs. But like many of the ISPs do still have like PFSense deployed on production on like massive scales. Uh, so they're like, hey, dude, you have the free BSD t-shirt. Can you figure out how to do this on PFSense? Because <laughs> PFSense officially says that they do, do not support it. 
uh, NAT64 ring. And I think there's like a plugin which does Taiga underneath. I'm, I, I couldn't understand the forums. I didn't even spend some time on it. But yeah, even the BSD router project use, uh, uses Taiga internally. Um, it's, 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 it's a pretty simple uh, configuration, to be honest. But yeah, I'll, I'll blog about it today. I'll blog about it by the end of the day on how to do PF with Taiga on FreeBSD. Love it. All right, I'll keep my eyes open. Yeah, and, and, and it worked fine. And I mean, um, it's not that I did any, uh, you know, what, what do you call that? Any um, uh, performance testing or anything, but I'm like, okay, uh, I can connect to GitHub where a jail has an IPv6 only address. So it works fine. And for uh, NAT64, uh, sorry, DNS64, which, you know, it converts a um, IP address into, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it converts an A record to an A, 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 A record. Uh, for that, I used Unbound and specifically the local Unbound, the one that ships with FreeBSD. Um, and it also can be done with Bind. But I did. Yeah, I did get it. To make sure. Yeah. Yeah, I did get it working with. I did get it working with Bind. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's both of them are like a, what was it like single line thing difference, you know, not not much of a hard configuration or anything. Um, what else did we do today? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, of course, we also configured the, um, what was PD? Uh, Perfects delegation. Um, I'm stuck there. I'll continue my training with the uh, RIPE administrators tomorrow. Uh, they're more Linuxy than BSD, but they do have a good idea. Uh, and the, my, what I'm planning to do is, let's say you have a VPS, say on DigitalOcean, Volter, or your own, and you have a slash 48 or slash, usually they provide you with a slash 64. The, my goal would be to have a separate, let's say, slash 80, and do that, a, a assign it to um, a prefix delegation where each jail would get its own IPv6 address automatically, right? And with DHCP v, with DHCP v6, it could also use stuff like the uh, Jan remind me a DUID. Was it um, called yes, the you can uh, put in a something like the host name and jail ID or exactly. whatever you want as DUID, yeah. so that the yeah. jail gets so the jail stable. always get the same IPv6 address all the time. You know, uh, and uh, um, that's my plan. You for could tomorrow. use that, uh, for example, to make sure that you can migrate a jail between hosts without having mm -hmm. to have a MAC address follow the jail yes. if the server does not override that and yeah. trust you to use the DUID. So if you yeah. have a not too stupid DHCP server, you should be able to have a stable lease basically follow it around. Uh, the and with name. something like a DHCP client daemon, it's like a one-liner in the configuration to set that. That's 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 a DHCP unique identifier. I know there's a like a, you know there's a, a what do you call that? Um, and it's an acronym inside an acronym. <laughs> I mean, it's not as bad as XML, but still. So it's DUID. Yeah, DUID, which okay. stands for DHCP Unique Identifier. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that's the goal for tomorrow to 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 have that, and um, uh, I've I've also integrated because because Jailer has Jailer in it DHCP, which will configure a DHCP server and everything for you. And yes, Michael, I actually added like dash n so you can specify a subnet and stuff like that. And now I'm going to do DHCP six. Uh, jailer init DHCP6 where it would uh, configure all of these stuff for you automatically as well. Um, I'm not sure what the best practice would be yet, but I'm, I'm doing it on, on Volter, which seems to be the most... Uh, uh, Jan also commented that you can also run Taiga in a jail. Uh, Jan, I did end up doing that, by the way. I did end up doing that because um, it, it made sense, you know? I mean, uh, it absolutely made sense. Um, uh, what else was... Oh, today was a lot of experiments. Um, uh, Jan, is it normal that a FreeBSD box would ignore router advertisement if it's IPv6 forwarding set to one? True. I assume. Of course, that that's RFC okay. compliant behavior. Okay, of course. Why am I asking this? Because what if I want a box to get an IP address from router advertisement? 
and then and then itself to become a router. Then what what's the correct way of doing that? Uh, the, I, I'm not 100% sure what's the correct way to do it, but uh, the problem with doing it like that is that um, you have to know which route you can use there. So whether you have to get a prefix to be a router, uh -huh. I see. Uh, which means that you're in practice, you're running DHCP uh, v6 okay. uh, with prefix delegation. And what then happens is that uh, your mid middle router is a DHCP v6 client with okay. prefix delegation. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So that it gets the prefixes for its downstream interfaces, and yeah. then it would act as route advertisement server, but not client on uh -huh. the other ones. What okay. it can Makes do sense. is that it can uh, get the um, its default word via route advertisement and mm -hmm. derive its, um, um, on the upstream interface, its uh, IP addresses via stateless auto configuration so that it only uses DHCP v6 for the prefix delegation and the additional administrative information. Um, I found out that the problem is that if you enable the uh, accept router advertisement flag on uh, the upstream interface, mm -hmm. and then maybe mess with the first CDL so that it looks at that despite being in forwarding mode and mm -hmm. put it in this kind of um, CPE mode uh, stuff where you're basically asking it to have a creative interpretation of the RFC, and then uh, all of that becomes troublesome with DHCP CD, but it isn't a problem if you let DHCP CD uh, handle the router advertisement so that you disable the accept router advertisement flag on the other interfaces of mm. the FreeBSD router and just let it act as a router so that the kernel doesn't know that there's a user space uh, application which just happens to listen to for router advertisements mm -hmm. and then process them, the kernel doesn't know or care. The kernel just sees that, oh, uh, yeah, something used a route socket or a netlink uh, socket to uh, change the routing table and assign IP addresses mm -hmm. and everything works correctly. Mm -hmm. And I found it very useful to have DHCP CD basically be this uh, extensible state machine for all of that. Okay. By writing like well, one or two little hooks, I, I can I share still, those afterward. Yeah, I, I still haven't seen an, uh, a cloud provider that does DHCP v6. Well, maybe there are. I just haven't looked that well, to be honest, because uh, that would be very interesting. All of them do 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 a router advertisement, which works fine. But then you're 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 hanging to the my issue, which is like okay, now I need to get router advertisement, then enable forwarding and then disable. Or browser advertise it's, it's it's kind of a weird part there but yeah overall i get your idea now now i understand how that should be done properly uh but yeah that would be a, the end goal probably to like have a way to um uh like on let's say digital ocean volter or whatever people are using these days get the ipv6 network and then delegate uh, some range of it back to the uh, jails mm -hmm. and um, you know have ipv6 uh only jails that can use dns 64 and NAT64 to go out. You can't really do it like that on most of them because they don't run something which looks like a real ethernet. So basically they're doing uh, some kind of special forwarding magic in the network so that they have a stateful uh, network which can scale out better than a learning ethernet network. So basically they directly know which virtual port is which IP address. So you have to know which IP addresses are forwarded to your interface. It doesn't behave like a real Ethernet. Well, and I mean... so the abstraction breaks down. Normally they will assign you a prefix range and it doesn't matter that you don't even have to do something like NDP or up proxy for it because it will just look at the IP address uh, to do all the forwarding decisions. So well, which means routing. that you can just uh, put alias IPs on your uh, interface and okay. then avoid all the overhead of doing the interactions and 
just run your jails uh, the old fashioned way with alias networking, unless you really, really need VNet, then you have to use uh, some kind of tunnel interface to connect it. And yeah, then you would use that part. Uh, actually, we you really don't have to. We, we didn't get an issue with that at all. I, I tried it on all the uh, providers that I had access to, and that that that, that doesn't seem to be uh, an issue per se. The, the cheaper also normally give you only a slash sixty four or even a smaller prefix, hmm. and then anyway. You Th those were my experiments for today. Tomorrow, the plan is to do a little bit more IPv6 and then uh, BGP. I don't know if anyone wants me to do anything specific on the BSD stuff, but uh, my goal is to uh, set up BGPs with VNet jails as a lab experiment with RPKI validation. But cool. I mean, the market for blog posts like that is like 10 people. So, <laughs> uh, 11. There you go, 11 people. And Rod, you had a clarification 11, on IPBW divert. Yeah, it was somebody earlier, and I'm not sure who asserted that IPFW divert and divert sockets only supported IPv4. And I so I was pretty sure that was wrong. So I went and read the kernel code and divert is actually has a special case for IPv6. So the divert, there should be no reason that, that IPFW cannot divert a V6 packet to user land. I, I haven't checked in a long time, but I did read all of the uh, re <laughs> release notes and it never came up that this has been added. Good to know. I just went and read the code. <laughs> like with uptime. Great. Go to the source. <laughs> yeah. And I got a feeling that that actually went in. I mean, that was one of the very early things was being able to um, Divert v6 packets to user land for massaging for, for very specifically for the doing things like 6.6 six and 6.4 six and, and all of that fun junk. Cool. Anything else on IPv6? And uh, yeah, I guess it's mostly v6. Cool. Entrena, keep us posted. Do share what you learn, even if there are only 11 people interested in BGP. Well, one, this... one, one oh, minor. Yeah. Yes, please, Dan. Uh, yeah. One minor, minor uh, that for the route advertisements, I noticed that the clients um, would get the route advertisement on initial boot, but I think I've mentioned this before on one of these calls. But uh, but then then if you do NetIF restart and routing restart, it it doesn't. So I have to restart the whole jail. No, to uh, there's a pick... it's a separate daemon. It's called RT Sol D. Yeah, no, I'm saying, yeah, that's what that's what I'm saying. It doesn't. Um, well, I, I I'm happy to. I'll make it. I'll make an experiment for for the next call or something. I guess. So but I I. I have, think Jan I've has done syntax the experiment. Here. Uh, the problem is the following: uh, router advertisement server is expected to multicast uh, unsolicited router advertisements every like five or ten minutes, which of course isn't how long you want to wait. Um instead, um, the kernel will send a request for a router advertisement, a solidification, when the link state flaps. But in a jail context, normally the link state won't flap, so the kernel won't help you there. So you kind of have to run the uh, route solidification daemon in user space. And I found it better to just tell it, hey, I'm a mobile system, I don't know, unreliable Wi-Fi, please ask every minute for a router advertisement if you haven't seen one, uh, to make sure that uh, it recovers from accidental or missed advertisements or whatever. Hmm. It's slightly noisy, but uh, it doesn't hurt much. All right. And you also yeah, need I, that to get, export the learned... Uh, DNS resolvers to resolve conf via the resolve conf uh, wrapper script. Yeah, it's it's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent possible that it did not wait more than thirty seconds to see if this worked before bouncing the jails. But I did try it like a half a dozen times with and without RTSOLD, mm -hmm. 
and it made absolutely no difference. It wouldn't, it would only pick. Okay, well, anyway, I now understand that uh, um, the flapping may need to be involved. So I'll, I'll look into that. Otherwise, the, you won't ask for one, but uh, you, there's a one shot version of that command without a D. So, um, and you can enable it with uh, debug. Uh, Debug output uh, to standard out in foreground, so dash uppercase and lowercase uh, d, and then it will tell you the exact decoded uh, packets it sent and received, so that you okay. see what's being advertised on the network. All right, uh, then in that case, I should figure out. Yeah, I should figure out exactly what I was doing wrong because someone else might put on themselves in in a similar fashion, and then um, and that and that, that that's helpful problem. for debugging. Another big problem you can encounter with jails is that jails start so much faster than actual hardware. So it's quite likely that you're still stuck in the uh, duplicate peer detection phase when your services try to bind to local IP addresses. And then you either they tell you, yeah, I'm bound to the, if you have some software which tries to bind to each IP address individually, you encounter problems, or if you bind it to the a specific IP address and it's not yet available, uh, that is also a big problem because you can then only bind to the all on the loopback address, basically. Um, so you may have to either put an artificial uh, delay in the startup for, or the duplicate ad, um, address detection to finish, or if you are reasonably sure about your network, just disable all um, um, duplicate uh, address detection support on that interface so that you don't wait for it and just say, yeah, I, I'm not going to have a MAC address collision. I'm using UI64, so um, I don't have to do duplicate address detection on this uh, interface. And then you have the addresses immediately available and don't uh, get into this kind of problem that, yes, the interface is there, but the address is not yet there because it's still uh, in the waiting for someone to veto them or for three seconds phase. The, the saddest part is when I was trying to configure IPv6 with my uh, Illumos machines. And I'm like, why is this not working? Why is this not working? Until I realized that, oh, um, Digital Ocean does not support IPv6 on custom images. <laughs> um, like, so does not yeah. support IPv6 on in... custom images. Like, I don't know why. Like, what's the reason to not? Maybe they have a shim images? in there on theirs that enable it. I guess. I think what they're probably doing is some kind of stupid uh, agent has to set that up. Uh, if you can look it up, put it in manually. Uh, there are parameters, and then try if it works. It's quite likely that they just haven't fixed it. So um, I have some experience with Digital Ocean and IPv6, and it's the reason why I'm no longer using Digital Ocean. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, the, in my case, I tried to explain and escalate the issue three times until I gave up, but it's easier to migrate off than deal with an utterly incompetent hoster who, if they have anyone knowledgeable about IPv6, refuses to let customers get in touch with them. Because what I observed is that they, their network uh, dropped any UDP packet with identical source and destination port numbers. If it's IPv6 and the port number is below 1024, so basically any low port with equal port numbers just got dropped by them. I saw it uh, in a BPF filter going out and in, her, but never in on the other side. And the only um, yeah applications which happened to be that is like NTP and uh, Ike. So I couldn't get my IPsec tunnels working because they were dropping all of the keys. And they claimed that such packets never occur and that it, if it I'm sending that this packet that's a mistake because it doesn't happen and. Anyway, they're not dropping it. Um, hmm. Yeah. Thank I you, Daniel. I can only assume that they are trying some defense against NTP amplifications or something and got a bit too enthusiastic with blocking. But yeah. 
And the other problem is that they're not de um, dedicating a full uh, slash 64 to each customer. So you can only get like 16 or so IP addresses. I haven't checked if that's still the case, but it used to be that you're only getting like 16 IPv6 addresses per uh, virtual machine. And you, it, you can end up sharing your slash 64 prefix with multiple idiots, which means that you're just waiting to end up on some kind of blacklist. Ah, uh, yeah, good point. And the blacklisting in IPv6 is normally per slash 64. So it could be that you're blocked as a malware host or something and your website is suddenly blocked by default in lots of browsers and plugins just because someone else sharing yeah. the slash 64 with you didn't care to update their WordPress. Interesting. Good observation. So let's change gears. Doug had given a little sweet update on the short and sweet update on the uh, OCI runtime working group. Doug, you, Doug, I found this during the uh, conference. It was this NAST, CNAST, I suppose, I'm not sure that's pronounced, which was another container of runtime with goals for FreeBSD. And so I thought, okay, I'll at least bookmark it, despite it being officially discouraged, goals are there. I welcome the reader to explore that. Okay, so Antoinette understood if you have to leave. So we've got also... Uh, Jan, you have some U UCL news, Rod and Chris. Oh, Chris. Oh, look at you. You actually put the docs in the doc. Excellent. Uh, Jan, briefly, what's your UCL news? So, uh, as I've mentioned before, I've been working on extending uh, libUCL with macros so that it um, can be used for daily to express the same thing you can already express with jail.com so that it's a pure superset of the features and you're not losing anything uh, you, you're likely to need in a jail configuration. Okay, it gets code then, public for that. Not yeah. yet, okay. um, but so now what I can do is um, through the right macros, I can have my uh, variables be, uh, uh, or maybe I should just, Share, um, share something. Uh, 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 uh. And you're, everyone's welcome to drop things in the doc. I'll, I'll format yeah. it. Uh, but that can go to the end if we have other topics. Okay. So it's all fair game. And your point to make those sort of compatible is quite clear. That is great. My point is that I want it to be possible to, it's not like drop incompatible and existing configuration will work, but mm -hmm. that you're not going to miss some kind of abstraction you could express Great. before in jail.conf and now you can't in UCL. So that it's truly a, not a different, but a more powerful configuration. And now, Okay, um, Sean, I can quickly show, show a little example of what I've been messing with. Uh, super quick, sure. In the doc, or are you sharing your screen? I'm about to share my screen. Okay. So as you can see here, uh, let me make that a, bit, a little bit smaller. Um, smaller, bigger. Bigger but smaller window so that it's bigger on the recording. How about the aspect ratio? Is that more or less okay? Or... So um, here you can see uh, I have uh, I used uh, VM state D as a test case uh, to mess around with what I think it makes sense to express. So I have something here the VM state D conf and then now I can basically go about here and in my directories ink file, I define a ban bunch of um, key value pairs, simple name equals string. And then I can import from the, with a glob 
from the current object, but uh, dot dot also works. So I can just now glop uh, as if it was a file system with the scalars as files and the uh, arrays and um, objects as directories because FreeBSD glob is flexible. So I could just use the glob from libc for that. Um, then uh, now that I have these, I can use them. And the other macro I implemented is um, the um, include directory. There's already a powerful include, but it's at only one level. And the, you can't really include more than one file under a prefix, but hey. With this extension, you can now um, say say something like, I want to start at depth zero. I want to go up to two levels deep in the folder structure. Um, I want to capture the variable name. And what I want to capture is the basically the name of the file to be included without the part, which is part of the glob pattern at the end. Uh, and only at level one. So that would then look something like this guests.dvm0.conf. So here I can now reference that variable to define it inside the guest. Uh, and then the variable is bound from the file name in vm0.conf, but the .conf part at the end, because that's uh, after the last uh, meta character in the glob pattern that gets removed. So because, um, yeah. So now uh, then it would get here, go here about trying to include other stuff. And now um, I can do something like this. Um, and and the, the, what I found really interesting is that we can do something a bit uh, confusing, but in my opinion, very useful. I can set the depth, minimum depth to one. So it skips over the first level, and now that changes the resulting configuration to that. So the get the uh, directory in between gets stripped as well, so that I, that I can get a flat view of things. Uh, yeah, you yeah, have been just playing around so that I can import stuff, and yeah, the import by default right now always uh, uses glob. I want to make glob optional again so that. Uh, and the try means that it's okay if the glob doesn't match anything. Otherwise, it will be an error if the glob doesn't match. And that's what I've done. Oh, and you can um, see uh, if you run, watch this uh, as a debug output. There's the, the include uh, underscore dear macro expands into this code snippet here. And that is then fed into the uh, parser. And I also implemented the set uh, macro, which makes it possible to register new variables with the libucl parser from inside the configuration while it's parsing it. So all of that can now be done. You can register potentially arbitrary stuff. So uh, you could also have a macro which helps you to define the list of variables you want to export to the shell or something as shell code so that you could have in your shell script, uh, basically uh, whatever you want to share and then a, a glob pattern of variables you want to share. Uh, stuff like that, uh, yeah. Cool. So That's you can do awesome, uh, yeah. complex uh, stuff. Uh, I wanted to use a uh, weak symbol so that I can't have basically a before and after. So uh, the setter <laughs> and macro so that you could either register a, a function by just defining it under a right symbol uh, that gets to either um, record which variables have been registered or gets to um, uh, veto variable names or uh, stuff like this so that it could say something like, sorry, but you're not allowed to, from inside here, from inside the start set, you're not allowed to change the name, the uh, jail ID or something that's a special variable, which you cannot just override or something. So that you could veto that from the before or maybe even rewrite the value and adding the ability for the uh, callback to rewrite the 
assignment is the part which I've just uh, tried to do and it uh, work. But yeah. And the other amazing part is that uh, we can do something like this. Um, So for example, for import, this here is the schema definition as JSON schema. And then a libucl has a validator for that. So that the um, arguments to the in, uh, macro invocation are uh, validated against that schema so you don't have to write that yourself. Any questions for Jan? So this would so be did a, I get this right, John? You're 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 working on the code for LibUCL, or how do you how do you actually implement that? Is uh, this something that is dynamically has, loaded, or LibUCL um, just has an API where you can register uh, function pointers as macros. Okay, and cool. that's how it interfaces. So it's so far I've managed to keep it completely outside of libucl so that it's just using the stable documented api to libucl the first prototype used undocumented internal apis but you can do it all by not having to redeclare symbols which are intentionally not declared in the header <laughs> um, but you can do it uh, by the way with the public API, I have to output this intermediate um, UCL configuration snippet for the includes and sets as a valid UCL document and then inject that into the current parser position where my macro is currently being passed. You can do that. I didn't know that you can do that because uh, uh, while it has like two sentences in the uh, header as documentation, that's all about the difference between add chunk and insert chunk, that the insert chunk uh, function inserts it in the current parser context instead of expecting it to uh, start from scratch as a new file. So uh, because of that, I can do it with that. Before that, I just uh, include, uh, de declared uh, the signature for their um, include macro function and call it directly, which is a bit more efficient, but it's uh, part of the implementation details you're not supposed to know about as a user of the API and you can do it through the API and it's not that bad and the performance isn't a problem for my use cases, which I foresee because it's faster than most pure JSON parsers. So that's not a problem. And one of the crazy things, for example, you can do is you can actually have uh, regex patterns on the keys allowed inside of a JSON object so that I can say something like, yeah, you're only in, allowed to have variables following the syntax for shell variables. So it has to start with A to Z or an underscore and then can continue with A to for Z uh, numbers or an underscore. So that is the, and you don't have to duplicate that logic in every macro. So yeah, that's quite nice. Cool. Anything else on that? Cool. Thank you for that demo and keep it coming. Keep it coming. So <clears throat> thank you, Chris. You kindly pointed out uh, Greg's hardware survey, and I will provide fresh information that, on that, which is the fact that I heard from several air quotes, FreeBSD vendors that uh, driver support is driving them off of FreeBSD, no pun intended. Uh, one example given was a certain oh, home, home and enterprise facing router distro provider having to write their own Intel 2.5 gigabit drivers. And that's because an Intel Enterprise NICs are pretty well supported, but the consumer stuff is not well supported and not well supported on FreeBSD. So they were not happy to do that and off they go to Linux. So it, how can we help in all of this, Chris? 
I think the main point is for really for Greg to get some data points to be able to understand where you know the priorities lie and where the majority of people actually see value. Just like you pointed out, uh, yes, I mean, we might be driving that way uh, one company if we don't do Intel, but maybe there's five others that are waiting for, uh, I don't know, I'll say AMD drivers. So I think the survey is really a helpful pointer for Greg um, where to spend the time or where to, where, where to prioritize Fox with the vendors and how to figure out uh, uh, where to put the energy in terms of driver generation and driver creation. Great. So yeah, hot topic and it keeps coming up. <clears throat> I mean, people want exotic stuff like hot pluggable GPU and someone said they have a vision for that from the Dev Summit, but drivers, drivers, drivers continually are an issue. So thank you for that. Um, segwaying, anything else, Doug, or shall we hear from Rod on what might be or slightly orthogonal, but not too much. Uh, if anything, uh, Rod, I want you to plant the seed on what was it time it forwarded VMs or something under jails? Yeah, I actually, I had somebody approach me. Um, this is an application in continuous integration about basically being able to time warp a beehive guest so that instead of waiting the wall clock time to the next VM return or the next scheduling of a VM, basically time warp the HPET and the TSC and everything forward to when that event would occur and just schedule the VM. Um, the application is is for, for time compressing CI runs that um, that are abnormally long because of of waiting for time events to occur hmm. don't know don't know if it's generally usable i know for the specific application it's usable so currently you're finding that waiting on the clock is slowing down the ci build is that vaguely accurate well, it's not a build. It's it's actually a test. A it's test. Okay. Okay. Functional testing of software, and that said software has timing timing dependent events that basically say, okay, I'm going to wait eight seconds for for this to potentially occur. Well, oh, um, okay. Like the the router advertisement. Yeah. Waits, we mentioned earlier, if you're waiting, you know, ten minutes on a, a news event, it's like, yeah, you're wasting a whole lot of time watching yeah. paint dry. The thing is, is we, we tweak all those timers so we don't have to wait 10 minutes for an RA. That's doing, interesting. Okay, doing, I'm getting it. Yeah, when we're doing testing of router software in a VM, we actually count, we crank RAs down to one second and stuff like that. So we, we're doing everything we can to time compress the testing. Um, one of the things that does occur is, is VMs get scheduled out to Yep, not going to wake up and do anything until the next second comes up. When in fact, if we could just go ahead and wake it up, let it run its thing, and and more than likely it would succeed. Um, if not, it has its own built-in timeouts, and it's going to reach a eye in the next one second interval. But um... so, uh, uh, just like watching old VHS tapes, you want to push fast forward and just have all yes, those things happen. Exactly. Um, okay. I don't want. I do not want to go through. I don't want to watch the advertisements. I have no reason to watch the advertisements. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, okay. I would worry that you will see lots of fallout from doing that because well, uh, lots of drivers will have some kind of logic like wait the initial delay and then try five times between these delays uh, for the hardware to come out of reset or something. Uh, so if you do that, this uh, is... and network protocols which will punish you for being too eager. Um, so that a uh, robust, for example, bitter and client, if you annoy them too often, you're get, hmm. getting on their naughty list. Okay. Uh, stop. So uh, maybe you can get something slightly uh, more intelligent in than just cutting any delay to zero to basically have a function that short delays are only 
shortened by a little and long delays are basically, the longer the delay, the higher the time compression factor basically. So that uh, you're not completely breaking anything with backups, you're just vastly accelerating them, especially the long delays. But for that to be possible to do it at a hypervisor level, you probably need an operating system which is uh, tickless and really exposes to the virtual timer the next time it wants to inter interrupt it instead of just using a one kilohertz or 100 hertz tick timer. Because then We've you can't do anything a clever. Kernel. We're already running in a tickless environment. In that case, you may it may make a lot more sense uh, from a just so that it's you're not breaking so much to time compress, uh, the longer the delay is, uh, the more you compress instead of just cutting it, waking up immediately again and pretending the time has passed. It's guaranteed you will find interesting things when experimenting with this. So, hey, uh, Rod, have you seen any other hypervisor do that? We know of no solution. Okay. Um, and you will also break things like NTP software will explode in your well, face because it John, will tell you. what don't you get about this is a test environment. We're completely yeah, sure. I, I get that. I'm just, NTP I'm just... is not going to be running. We're not going to be running general purpose TCP stack stuff out to some host somewhere else. This is all okay. very specific continuous integration of a software product on a tickless kernel. It just, the, none of those problems exist for this. I'm just trying to think ahead of I how get you that, can get the most out of that, even for a completely controlled environment. He wants so a Petri they, dish. Let's see if we can get him a Petri dish. Yeah. Um, Rod, you know more about Beehive than the average user. Did Do you think it presents itself in its internal time handling any way, shape, or form? Technologically, I believe it would be possible to enhance the VM exit code to, to say that you'd have to set a flag to say that this, this is a time accelerated VM. And if you're going to, if you're basically going to stay in a VM exit state till the next H pad or timer tick or something like that, just go ahead and forego that. And so it would be, you'd have to modify the, the virtualized H pad and virtualize TSC stuff because you're going to time warp the machine. Um, but you don't want things like TSCs to be completely out of whack because there's that's probably the most... Even on a tickless kernel, TSC is used for time measurement. So you can't just not adjust the TSC. So if I, is what I'm getting at is if wall clock suddenly appeared to have elapsed, you need to adjust the TSC by the appropriate amounts. Okay. Uh, seed planted. Do bring it up. Yeah. Over the, I used, you know, coming I weeks. Used, thank really, you for that. this I want feed. I need to get feedback from somebody like John Baldwin or Peter Green or somebody else that know the more intimate movie. Oh, people. totally. No, totally. It's, it's going to have to get tweaked. But. Wouldn't there be some kind of VM exit to handle the uh, register write emulation? And that be forwarded to the Beehive user space process or is that truly handled inside the VMM kernel module? I believe the VM exit is completely handled inside the VMM. I don't think it ever goes to any type of user level. Okay, that would make uh, that a bit more involved. Well, yeah, do run it by those folks. Um, I see, uh, I'm having flashbacks to video games where you run them on your new computer and everything's really fast because it was, you know, timing it off something inappropriate and assuming certain lag. So anyway. Well, yeah, I would, I, I would, I would, yeah. the, the thing is, is for this type of testing, it doesn't do any, we can't accelerate the test by running on faster CPUs because it doesn't do any good because these things are all timer event driven sure. crap blowing it down so it doesn't doesn't matter how many megahertz we throw at these the, the ci run it takes the same amount of wall time yeah interesting okay i i see it i get it that's cool and let's yeah get that well one seed is planted too let's just keep reaching out with that um anything else on that 
Uh, Chris, there are several parallel discussions relating to all things true NAS. I'll leave it at that. I think you're pointing to a, a web page that certain folks prefer not share too widely about a true NAS continuation slash fork slash thing slash thing. So exactly. I was wondering whether that is something, you know, where, where to place that. I can talk more after we pause the recording. Uh, let's see other Got topics. Uh, ba, 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 ba. I've been throwing things from the Dev Summit on the Beehive page and the ZFS page. There will be a ZFS leadership meeting later today, I believe. Um, any of those topics can wait. So uh, I'll just say, hey, do you have anything else? Because we've certainly covered a lot of good ground on this call. Let's maybe call it good. But uh, several have had to drop off, understandable. It's tax time, and we haven't had Jamie because of that. So, Chris, Rod, Jan, anything else? Or shall we call um, it? Yes. Is there any Mac or anyone would like to see inside of UCL-based applications? Oh, uh, that is a very valid one. Uh, any Mac requests? Or any kind of callbacks uh, invoked from the Mac so that you can observe them? Mm. Would that maybe. be something for a mailing list, perhaps? I mean, I'm yeah, very glad you're reaching so out. And I have cleaned up the code. So that cool. I, yeah, we'll keep it coming. Uh, 18. Well, how about I call it at this time, and we'll chat around if you like. Uh, See, I hope I got that right. Well, thank you, everyone. I will catch you perhaps tomorrow for the ZFS call, perhaps later today for the other ZFS call, and then for the other production user calls. Thank you. And Chris, you want to call it? Like and subscribe. Boom. Thank you, everyone.